All right. John Stott, in his book, The Cross of Christ, writes this. He says, For Christians as for Christ, life spells conflict. But for Christians as for Christ, it should also spell victory. He goes on to tell us that, that Christ has defeated Satan with his work on the cross. And now, because Christ has been victorious, we are also victorious. Amen. And our victory consists of not necessarily being superhumans, but of continually striving to enter into the rest of the finished work of Jesus Christ and to experience the benefits that come from knowing him. And so what I mean by that is Christ is seated in the heavenly places, which means that Christ is seated above and his enemies are under his feet. And if Christ is seated above and his enemies are under his feet, then that means that we are seated above and our enemies are under our feet. Now, don't take this literally. I'm not saying that the person you disagree with the most is under your feet. Let's not hear that, but we'll get into that a little bit. And now because we are seated with Christ, we are invited to take his victory forward into the world. Jesus tells his disciples that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Which, I don't know if you catch that nuance there, but gates, that means that the kingdom's advancing. We're not playing defense, we're on offense here. And the gates of hell have no hope of prevailing against the kingdom. The kingdom's advancing. But I think we also have to recognize that it's not always this simple. It's not always victory. It's not always winning the day. You see, the devil has been defeated and, and Satan has been defeated, but he is not willing to admit it. And he still wields great power. And so continually throughout the New Testament, we as believers are warned against these spiritual powers. And we are called to be on watch and to recognize that our only hope of victory is, and overcoming is from Jesus. It's only from him that we have hope for the future. And these spiritual forces have set themselves in opposition to Christ and his church and we have no hope of standing unless we are strong in the Lord's strength. And John Stock continues to say this in his book. He says, On one hand, we are assured that having been born of God, Christ keeps us safe and the evil one does not touch us. On the other hand, we are warned to watch out because the same evil one prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I think what we'll often see in the church today is, is two different camps. We have, we have those who are really focused on Christ's victory and those who seem to be really focused on the spiritual powers at hand. And so I think what happens is, is when we invest our lives into one of those camps, we miss the full picture of what we're being invited into. So let me give an example. I think we can see something of triumphalism. We, we believe we can never lose we're only focused on Christ's victory and because of that, we're overlooking serious biblical warnings to be aware of the fact that there are spiritual forces that are stronger than us. And the other side, I think, shows up in becoming a defeatist where we completely forget that Christ has given us victory. We completely ignore his ability to overcome sin, to overcome Satan. And instead of resting in the finished work of Christ, we're overlooking the, the work of Christ on the cross and we're only seeing the devil. We're only seeing the bad. And so I think that this tension between these two exists because we exist in what is referred to as the already but not yet. And, and let me unpack what that means for just a minute. You see, there are already some very present realities of the kingdom of God that belong to us now as believers. They're already very present realities that belong to us now. They are inaugurated by Christ in his life, death, and his resurrection. 
and the kingdom is advancing, but, but I think we can all say, experiencing brokenness, that it's not yet complete. Like, if this is it, if this is what it is, I think we've been shortchanged a little bit. Like, there's got to be something more. I mean, there's some beautiful realities of knowing who we are in Christ, but there's also the reality that life is incredibly difficult and filled with pain, and, and we feel brokenness daily in our lives. You see, we are already sons and daughters. We're no longer slaves, yet we still wrestle with this tension where we are not experiencing full freedom from sin. We don't always fully recognize our identity as sons and daughters. We see pain and suffering in the world. And that doesn't seem to line up with the kingdom of God. So what do we do with that? Well, well we recognize that there is already present realities of the kingdom of God available to us, but there is some that we won't experience this side of eternity. And I think what happens is if we put too much focus on the already aspect of the kingdom, it will lead to us having a misshapen view of the world. We'll live outside of the reality that wickedness actually exists in our world and it can exist in our church and it can exist in us. We'll lean into moral and physical perfection expecting those things, but these realities are saved for the not yet. We will not experience perfection until the day when Christ's kingdom is fully re ruling and reigning everywhere. Not until Christ returns. And that doesn't mean that we won't see miraculous healings or victory over sin, but we're never going to experience complete perfection in these areas this side of Christ's return. Now, on the other side of that, too much focus on the not yet, of how it's, it's not completely fulfilled yet. The not at yet aspect of Christ's kingdom leads us to having a, a really poor defeatist attitude, which, which is incompatible with Christ's victory, right? If Christ has been victorious on the cross, then we should always have hope. We should never look at a situation and say that this is a hopeless situation because Christ has given victory over all things and we have hope that one day he will completely inaugurate his kingdom and that is not something that anyone can stop. And so we should always be a people filled with hope and conviction in the kingship of Christ. And so what I want to do today is to help us to see Christ's victory, but also help us to see the very real enemy that we're going up against. And I want to give us some practical tools to not only combat the enemy, but also to rest in Christ. So let's go ahead and do this. If you could open your Bibles to Esther chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. But before we get there, just so you know where I'm going today, here's my main idea. Take this with you. Jesus always wins. Jesus always wins. Esther chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had occurred, he tore his clothes put on sackcloth and ashes, went into the middle of the city and cried loudly and bitterly. He went only as far as the king's gate since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. There was great mourning among the Jewish people in every province where the king's command and edict came. They fasted, wept, and lamented, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Esther's female servants and her eunuchs came and reported the news to her, and the queen was overcome with fear. She sent clothes for Mordecai to wear so that he would take off his sackcloth, but he did not accept them. Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who attended her, and dispatched him to Mordecai to learn what he was doing and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square in front of the king's gate, Mordecai told him everything that had happened as well as the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the slaughter of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa, ordering their destruction so that Hathak might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and command her to approach the king, implore his favor, 
and plead with him personally for her people. Hathak came and repeated Mordecai's response to Esther. Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to tell Mordecai, all the royal officials and the people of the royal provinces know that one law applies to every man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courtyard and who has not yet been summoned. The death penalty. Unless the king extends the gold scepter, allowing that person to live, I have not been summoned to appear before the king for the last 30 days. Esther's response was reported to Mordecai. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther, Don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it's against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded him. On the third day, Esther dressed in her royal clothing and stood in the inner courtyard of the palace facing it. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the royal courtroom facing its entrance. As soon as the king saw Queen Esther standing in the courtyard, she gained favor in his eyes. The king extended the gold scepter in his hand toward Esther, and she approached and touched the tip of the scepter. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for your word, that you have gifted it to your church so that we can better understand who you are and what it is that you have done for us, Lord. We thank you for your providence. Without knowing that you are sovereignly governing all things, Lord, I feel like we just have no hope in tr trying times such as this. So we thank you, Lord, that we can trust you and that you are good. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so some of you are like, hey, last night... Like last week we were at David and Goliath and now we're all the way at Esther. Like what just happened? How did you skip so much? Well, I'm not going to. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what happens. So last week we were talking about David and Goliath in our series of Christ Meets Me Everywhere. Our goal is to see Christ in the Old Testament to show how the scripture all finds its culmination in him. And now we as Christians bear that as our conviction going forward, that Christ is in all of Scripture and He is the message we have. And so last week we talked about David and how David went forward as the rejected king to stand in the gap on behalf of his people. And David, after defeating Goliath, goes through a trying season but inevitably ends up becoming the king of Israel. He becomes king, and, and between David and his son Solomon, there's a season of prosperity in the land. But what we soon find out is that the nation will begin again to rebel against the Lord, which is something we've seen in the people's lives throughout the story of Israel, that they will inevitably turn from the Lord and to wickedness. And so due to their rebellion, the Israelite people are actually exiled from the promised land. And as they are exiled from the promised land, the nation of Babylon comes in and drags them away. And they exist in this time of exile Babylon over time is overtaken by the Persian Empire and the Persian Empire begins the process of allowing the Jews to go home, back out of exile, back to the promised land. And during this process, some choose to go home, but some decide we kind of like it here. And so they stay in exile and they stay under the rule of the Persian Empire. And that's where we pick up our story today. The king in this story, in the story of Esther, is a man by the name of Ahasuerus, and he is the king of Persia at the time. 
Now, in the beginning of the story, we find out that he has a queen, and her name is Vashti. And the king, well, he's a little bit of a partier. And he's a little bit of a drunkard. And he throws a seven-day rager. And at the end of this seven-day rager, he's like, hey, you know what we should do? We should bring out my beautiful queen and have her present her herself to all these people and show off her beauty to everyone here. Which, I don't know about you, but I would not be interested in showing off my beauty at a party with drunken people. And so she denies it. She says, no, I will not do this. And the king becomes very angry. And I just have a brief side note here. Ladies in the room, if, if a man ever becomes angry when you refuse to be the object of his perverted self-gratification, you are not in the wrong for saying no. And it's okay to seek help. All right, let's move on from that. So this king then proceeds to banish this woman for disobeying him. He banishes her. She's no longer allowed to be the queen. He's going to give his position to someone else. And we learn a little bit more about this shady king and the fact that he has beautiful virgins from all across the nation brought to him so that they can partake in a competition to see who can win his favor. And they're there to compete for his favor and for the position of queen, which as we've just learned from Vashti is not a good position to be in. It's not necessarily a position that you want. And one of these young memen, w women is, is a Jew that has stayed in the land of exile. Her name is Esther. She's an orphan girl that is raised by her cousin Mordecai, and she's ripped from her home and the only family she has. She's forced to hide her identity, and she's enrolled in what is essentially slavery. And what we see throughout Esther's story is that everywhere she goes... Everywhere she goes, she finds favor. And remarkably, she ends up finding favor with the king and is elevated to the position of queen. Now, the king in this story also has an advisor, and this advisor's name is Haman. And he lifts Haman up to the second in command of the nation, to the highest position in the kingdom. And, and he is now worthy of worship in the Persian Empire. And so wherever he goes, people are supposed to bow to him and, and pay him the respect that he deserves from his position. But the story tells us that Mordecai, Esther's cousin, refuses to do so. He refuses to bow down. And so Haman, who is the villain in this story, the enemy in this story, becomes so angry that he not only wants to see Mordecai killed, but he wants to see all the Jews destroyed. And so he goes before the king and he begins to accuse the Jewish people of breaking his laws and he convinces the king based upon some evidence that he has that these individuals should be destroyed and we should rid the world of the Jews. And this is what he does and this is how the story unfolds. And so Mordecai and the Jews find out about this and they respond by donning sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes and lamenting. As you would do as well if you found out your entire family was about to be destroyed. And so Mordecai, who, who is, a, is a member of the king's uh, gate staff, he laments at the king's gate. He goes before the king's gate and he laments there in the public square where everyone can see it. Esther hears of Mordecai's public lamentation and she reaches out to understand why he could be so dismayed, what has happened. And then the dialogue begins in, in our passage today and, and Mordecai tells Esther, of the tragic decree that has been issued that, that all of the Jews will be slaughtered and that the accuser, Haman, is actually paying to have that done. So all the Jews will be slaughtered and, and he begs Esther to reveal her identity as a Jew. Reveal who you are. Help your people. And he begs her to intercede on behalf of the people. 
And Esther responds with, I can't go because I'll die. And what we find out in the narrative is that if Esther were to step into the king's courts without being summoned, if he were to, she were to come into his presence without his permission, the, the law was the death penalty. The law was you would die. And so Esther sees this and she's like, man, if I go in, I haven't been summoned in like a month. The, he just doesn't want anything to do with me. He's bored with me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna die if I do this. But there is a caveat here. There's, there's one exception. If the king sees her and decides that he doesn't want this person to die, this person can break the law, he raises his golden scepter and it's a sign of favor. And this person will not be punished for entering into his presence. And so Esther says, I can't. I'm, it's too much. And Mordecai responds with, you will not escape this either. This decree includes you. You are going to die whether you marry yourself to the cause of your people or not. Whether you intercede on our behalf or not, this is what this looks like. The Jews are going to be slaughtered. Don't think you'll escape it just because of your position. Deliverance will rise up at some point for our people. He has confidence in that, but he also recognizes that it's not gonna be before his family is destroyed and before she is also destroyed. And so we get this famous line that is, that is used, perhaps you have come for the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, because I don't want to ignore some practical application, I do believe that God is providentially working in our world today. And I do believe that perhaps he has provided the church to this nation for such a time as this. I don't disagree with that. But I think something we're seeing in this picture is when God seems to be absent, we can have confidence that he is providentially working out deliverance for his people. Which there's a cross connection to that because it would seem that in death, God would be absent. And yet, that's the place where God is interceding through his son on behalf of his people. So for such a time as that, Jesus came. But here we have this story of Esther. For such a time as this, she's invited into this opportunity to intercede on the behalf of her people. And so she, she hears Mordecai's plea and she says, okay, fast for three days. You, all the Jews, I'll fast. My servants will fast. And at the end of the three days, I will go before the king, and if I perish, I perish. And so Esther, at the end of the three days, dresses in her royal clothes, and, and here this young woman who for her entire life has been forced into the position of self-preservation is now forced into a position of risking her life. She steps into the inner court and awaits her fate. And the king sees her and he has favor upon her. He raises his golden scepter and in this moment, the story seems to take a turn. There seems to be hope for the people. As we find out after this, the king not only has favor, but then he invites her to ask for anything she wants, up to half the kingdom. Anything you want, I'll give it to you. And that's an insane amount of favor. And so she, she invites, es Esther invites the king and, and Haman, this wicked, oppressive accuser, to a dinner. And at that dinner, she invites them again to the next dinner. And at the next dinner, she reveals Haman's wicked plot and plan to destroy her people. She reveals her identity. 
And the king becomes so angry that he destroys Haman and he sets out and sets a new decree that allows the Jews now to protect themselves, to not just be slaughtered unlawfully, but to actually be able to stand up for themselves against the enemy. And then we see throughout the end of the story as well, Mordecai elevated, a man who was once in need of saving is now elevated to second in command in the entire nation. And so in this story, we have, we have four characters that jump out to us that we need, to, we need to draw some parallels for. The first is there's a ruler. The second is an accuser. The third is a people in need. And the fourth is an intercessor. So our first character, the ruler, who sees to it that judgment is rightly poured out on those who transgress the laws. Then we have an accuser who sets out to destroy the people of God. He accuses the people before the ruler and so they are set to be judged, punished for their rebellion. And third, we have a people in need who are lamenting their impending doom and they reach out to help that exists only beyond themselves. And finally, we have an intercessor who hears the pleas of the people sees the accusation of the accuser and steps in to put her life on the line in order to secure the deliverance of her people. And these four characters in this story, although imperfectly, will reflect our story in the story of Christ. So we see God who is a ruler. And now here's what I want to be really careful that we don't do. We don't say that this king is perfectly picturing God because this king is terrible, right? He's wicked. But he is a ruler who has the power to punish a people who are disobeying. And that's important for us to recognize here in this story. Just so you guys know, kids cry. I don't know if any of you have kids, but they do cry. It's okay. All right? <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to start crying now, okay? I just want everyone to know that. All right. So we have God, who is a ruler. Like I said, not like this king. He, God is good and he is just and he is never one to do wrong. He is perfectly holy. But we do see ruler contrasting ruler here. One who has the right and the responsibility to punish wickedness, to punish the transgression of the law. And so we have God, a ruler who has established his law and written it on the hearts of all men. Now again, don't hear me say that he is a drunken womanizer. That's not what I think God is. He's not that. But he is a ruler and his law has been transgressed. And Satan, the accuser, brings all of our sins before God and points out how deserving we are of punishment. He accuses every single one of us before God. And God, who is a righteous judge of sin, has no right, has no way around it but to punish sin. He has to, otherwise he's not righteous. He's not holy. And so he has to punish sin. And what we learn throughout the Bible is that the wages of sin is death. But God is also faithful to provide an intercessor Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, is sent to intercede on behalf of His people. And though He was perfect, He takes all of the accusations Satan can throw at us and He bears the judgment of God for those sins on the cross. And in doing so, He strips the accuser of His power and He is now defeated. Now, when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He doesn't hear the accusations because Satan has been defeated and casted out because the blood of Jesus silences the accuser. Now, when God looks at us, he sees his son who always finds favor with him. Always. 
And if you're a Christian in this room, if you have turned from your sin, believed the good news of the kingdom, and collapsed into the arms of Christ, the only intercessor between God and man, then this is true of you. This is who you are, faultless and favored in the eyes of God. But if you aren't a Christian in the room, offered to you right now as a non-accusatory place to stand. A place where freedom and life are found and all you have to do is believe the good news of Jesus and collapse into the arms of Christ, turning from your sin and looking to him. But I think we have to recognize that that the accuser is still raging against the people of God. Now he has, he has been defeated. He has no say. God will not hear him anymore. He's been silenced. But he's mad about it. And what we see in the end of the story of Esther is there's still a battle to fight. You see, they, they still have to then go on the offensive to make sure that they do not get destroyed still. And we still have a battle to fight. It's a very real battle. Now that battle is won. We are now on the offensive. But it doesn't mean that there isn't still work to be done. The accuser's favorite tactics to use against the people of God are misbelief and despair. He's going to do everything he can to cause you to misbelieve about God or to misbelieve about your identity and to get you to despair in your circumstances and to lose hope. And it's really important for us to be able to identify the enemy when he is doing these things to us. And so I think we, we need to recognize that there is still an accuser who's whispering into our ears who's trying to get us to misbelief and to despair. The enemy is not the people around us. The enemy is not your husband. It's not your wife. It's not your coworkers. It's not the people in the body of Christ. But he is going to do everything he can to turn your eyes away from himself and turn your eyes towards those around you. And he's going to hit you where you are most vulnerable. The other enemy is ourselves because you can always count on sinners to sin. And that's who we are. We're, we're sinners who have been saved by grace. And, and as we discussed earlier, we'll never see complete and total victory over our sin in the present realities of today until the day when Jesus returns. And so because of that, there's still a reality that we're our own worst enemy. We make the devil's job really easy sometimes. Because sinners always sin. And so you have to know the truth. You, you have to know the word of God in order to enter into this fight. Amen. You just have to. You, you have to know your Bible. You have to be in this book. You have to see what God has to say to you. It is vital for you to know what it is that God has done in the pages of Scripture and what it is that he continues to do for you now as he intercedes on your behalf. Because the accuser's tactic is going to be to get us to question God. It's going to be to get us to move into disbelief. The question of did God really say? And he'll, he'll be a smooth talker did God, oh, come on, did God really say that it was wrong? I mean, that was just cultural. You know, it was a book, a book written, you know, 2,000 years ago. It's 3,000 years ago. It's not, it's not really wrong. No, come on, come on. If God was good, wouldn't, wouldn't he just want you to have everything you ever wanted? Wouldn't he just want you to have all the good things? He wouldn't want you to sacrifice. I mean, this thing, it's, it's not really that bad. And it's only one time. 
And then as soon as that works, he switches gears and he goes from a sweet and smooth talker to a vicious, shame-driven voice in your head. He goes from, oh, it's fine, to God could never love someone like you. God could never love someone who does something like that. You will never overcome this. You might as well just give up. Real Christians don't struggle like that. And what happens is when we begin to believe these things and we fall into a, visi- we fall into a vicious cycle of shame believing the, eyes of the lies of the enemy, believing the way that he looks at us and believing his accusations against us. And so we have to be vigilant about knowing what it is that God has said so that when those lies enter in, we can combat them with truth. Martin Luther is famous for, as the devil would speak words to him and whisper into his ears, he would say, you have no claim here, for I have been baptized. Baptism is this moment where you enter into the death of Christ, being submerged in water, and you rise to newness of life. Just as Jesus had died on the cross, you have died with Jesus on the cross, and you have raised to life with him. And so if that is true of you, then baptism is that perfect reminder that I was, I was dead, and I am alive. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So Satan, I have been baptized. And so today, if you have not been baptized, I would encourage you to come talk to me after service. This is a gift that the Lord has given to the church as a weapon against the enemy, as a reminder of our identity. It's not something to be shirked off or to be taken lightly. In fact, it's one of the most valuable weapons we have. I think that's why they just started baptizing Christians as soon as they got saved. They're like, hey, you need to at least get baptized so you remember this part. We have to know the truth of the gospel. That that in our very worst moment, not in your best moment, in your worst moment, the moment that the accuser had the most ammo, you were caught red-handed in the cookie jar. That's the moment that Jesus climbs up onto that cross and dies for you. That moment right there. Whether that was 20 years ago or whether that's tomorrow, that is it. That's the moment when he dies for you. And so if he dies for you at your very worst, then shouldn't we be able to believe that that even in moments where we don't feel like we're good enough, he's still dying for us then? You have to know that Jesus did not die for you at your best. He died for you at your worst. And we have to strive to enter into the finished work of Christ. We have to strive to know him and know what it is that he's done for us. Dane Ortland, in his phenomenal book, Gentle and Lowly, writes this. He says, we all tend to have some small pocket of our life where we have difficulty believing the forgiveness of God reaches. We say we are totally forgiven and we sincerely believe our sins are forgiven, pretty much anyway. But there's that deep, dark part of our lives, even our present lives, that seems so intractable, so ugly, so beyond recovery. God's forgiving, redeeming, restoring touch reaches down into the darkest crevices of our souls. Those places where we are most ashamed, most defeated, More than this, those crevices of sin are themselves the places where Christ loves us the most. Jesus never ceases to bring his atoning work before the Father on our behalf. He never ceases to intercede for his people. And this is the work that he continues to do for you and me right now. He has not stopped He continues to intercede for us in heaven because we continue to miss the mark, because we continue to fail, but he never lets go. And he carries us all the way. So the first is you have to know the truth. 
you have to know who you are. And the second, I think you have to surround yourself with people who can remind you of these truths, who, can be complete, who you can be completely real with, where there's no unknown corners in your life. They know every aspect and they're able to preach the gospel to every aspect and to help you walk in victory. We've been given victory. We have not been given death, but we have been given life. And the only way that we can see this victory come out is when we start to actually invite the gospel into the deepest parts of our lives. The worst thing that you can do is isolate yourself from the people of God to try and go it alone. I think the isolation that, that we've been facing over the last year and a half has been one of the enemy's greatest tactics. That he has isolated the people of God. He has separated them from the, uh, the reminder of the body, from the good news of Jesus, and he has left them to face him alone. And we are no match for the enemy on our own. Every time we're getting whooped. Every time. And so we need people in our lives who know us. And not just like, yeah, that's, that's my friend. He's cool. But like, no, they know me. They know who I am. They know my darkest moments. They know my deepest secrets. They know my biggest shame. And they're not afraid to preach the gospel in those places. They're not afraid to lift me up when, when I feel the defeat of the enemy coming down because those things are no longer who you are. You've been, you've been favored by Jesus. Because Jesus has taken up your cause and he intercedes on your behalf, God now has favor over you. So we don't need to hide from him. We can't. And we don't need to hide from the body of Christ because we exist for each other. You need to know the hero, the one who always wins. Jesus always wins and he does so because his shed blood will always speak a better word than the accuser and it will always speak a better word than your sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent your son to intercede on our behalf. Lord, we thank you that the battle is won even though we fight. May we continue to look to you as our only hope of victory. It's in your name we pray.